Hey, what's up, Thrive? Uh, welcome to our brand new series that I basically failed to give a title. I don't know. We can call it a response to COVID-19, whatever you want to call it. Over the next four weeks, I want to talk to you about some things that are based around the coronavirus, some things that we can learn and some ways that we can navigate and grow through this really weird and this really difficult time in our lives and in our country's history. It's, it's just kind of crazy right now. And so beginning with today's sermon, I wanted to take a different approach. There's a whole lot of negativity going on right now. There's a lot of fear. There's a lot of anxiety. And, and in the, the future sermons, I actually want to deal with those things. But today, I figured we'd go ahead and start out actually looking at some positive things, looking at some ways that we can actually positively grow because of coronavirus. Doesn't mean I'm not going to challenge you. It doesn't mean that you're not going to have to do some introspection and, and kind of uh, think about your relationship with Jesus. But I just mean that today I don't want to focus on the bad things and the bad part of coronavirus. I want to focus on the good things because I think in the midst of all of this craziness, we've actually been presented an opportunity to grow closer to Jesus because of the things that are happening. That because life is just kind of slammed on the brakes and everything is slowed down, we actually have a wonderful opportunity to realign ourselves and come out of this crisis as deeper, stronger Christians. And I want us to do do that today. And so as we look at coronavirus, one of the things that we have the opportunity to do is to actually slow our lives down and get back in to God's word. We have an, an opportunity rather to reflect and then to read God's word, especially if pre-coronavirus pandemic, we weren't really in God's word. Because God's word is so important. I mean, it is so important. First, I want to begin by reading you Psalm 1. I want to read the whole psalm that speaks about the importance of God's word. So just lean in real quick. This is a short psalm, but it's a beautiful one. It says this, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper." The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Now that entire psalm is talking about the importance of getting in God's word. The psalmist gives us two people, two kinds of people, the unrighteous and the righteous. He says that the unrighteous, they, they walk in their own way, they do their own thing, that they're not on God's side, they don't get to sit in the congregation of God's people, and that ultimately they will blow away in the wind, they will die, they will come under judgment. But God's people, God's people, are like a tree that's planted beside a river, planted beside a stream that is healthy, is nourished, is growing. It produces fruits. It's, it's not going to come under judgment, but it's with God's people that God recognizes the way that those people live and they live in a righteous way. But what is the main difference? Why do the unrighteous people live unrighteously? And why do the righteous people live well and produce good fruit? Well, it's because they delight in the law of the Lord. The righteous people love God's word and the unrighteous people are arrogant and they kind of do their own thing. The scripture tells us that scripture itself nourishes us and it feeds us and we produce good fruit when we get in that regular nourishment and that regular diet of staying in God's word. And it actually produces righteousness in us. Not like a righteousness that says, I read my you know, Bible today, I checked it off the list and God's not angry at me. But that when we read God's word, like it actually makes us righteous. It produces the fruit of the spirit 
in us. God's word is so important. When we get that healthy diet, it produces healthy fruit. And I remember a time in my life where I didn't actually have a very healthy diet at all. I was in college. I was really, really busy. I was working. I had um, social responsibility. I was was dating Elizabeth. I was doing stuff at the church all of the time. I was full-time at college. It was crazy. And so it seemed like for a couple of months, every day, Every day I ate fast food, and fast food is terrible for you. And so after a while, I basically, like my body started to break down. I'm not kidding. I was like 19, and like I was breathing hard, just walking. Like my body ached, and it felt so bad. I was gaining weight. Like it was nasty. And so eventually I was like, all right, I can't do this anymore. Like I've got to do better. And so I began to cut back. I I was cutting back on carbs. I wasn't eating fast food all the time. I'd established a daily rhythm of running every day. And finally, I actually began to lose weight, like noticeably. I was feeling better. much healthier all because I rearranged my diet. I got some some good nutrition and then I saw results. And the same thing is true with God's word. But with the coronavirus, it gives us some time to reflect. Pre-coronavirus, I want you to think about your life. Was your life one that was busy, that was filled with all kinds of stuff, that was filled with sports and grades and school and friends and all of this kind of stuff? And you know, when we get busy, just like I did, we go through the drive through and we eat junk food. Well, did you have a junk food spiritual life because of your busy schedule? Like, honestly, did you fill your life with God's word that was nutritious and edifying? Or did you fill your life with spiritual and media fast food? So basically Netflix, YouTube, Disney Plus, video games, whatever else, without any room for God's word. Like, just even if you got to pause the video, think about your life pre-coronavirus. And then I want you to think about the fruits of that life. Like, were you healthy spiritually? Did you produce the fruit of the Spirit? Were you patient? Did you have joy? Were you kind? Were you loving to other people? Were you serving God? Or is it producing selfishness and bitterness and anger and whatever else is sinful? Seriously, just think about your life. Because if you're being honest with yourself, if you have a really bad spiritual diet, it's going to produce really bad spiritual fruit. But because of this coronavirus, we actually have a positive opportunity to slow down, to reflect on our lives, and then actually reorient our lives around a good, healthy spiritual diet of God's Word. And so now that you've paused, now that you've reflected, If you found that after that reflection, you actually weren't in God's word, you actually weren't reading, you actually had bad spiritual fruit, here's my challenge to you during this time. You can't use the excuse that you're too busy, that you've got too much going on. It's like illegal to go outside right now. That's a joke, but you know what I mean? So here's my encouragement to you. All of the excuses are off the table. I want to challenge you to get in God's word and read. Get in his word and watch it transform your life. When you get that good nutrition like a tree planted by water, it will nourish you spiritually and produce good fruit in you. You have the opportunity to come out of this pandemic a better Christian and a better person that's ready to be a world changer when everything goes back to normal. So here's my challenge. Get in God's word. I want you every single day, pick a time. Maybe it's, a, it's the evening. Maybe it's early in the morning. Maybe it's right after lunch. I don't know. Pick a time that works for you. Grab your favorite Bible. Download the YouVersion Bible app. Grab, grab your favorite study Bible. Get something consistent that you're going to read. If you need some, some organization, don't just you know open up the Bible, point your finger, and start reading. I want to encourage you, either begin a devotional on the YouVersion Bible app, or pick a book of the Bible and begin reading through it. Like I've been reading through the New Testament on my own, and so it gives me organization. I know I'm not going to go hopping around. I'm just going to go book after book after book and take it all in. Do it in a way that's manageable. So don't feel like you've got to read the whole Bible in a month or anything crazy like that. Read one to two chapters a day and then reflect on it. 
Apply it to your life. Let it transform you and change you because it will. And then here's what I want to encourage you to do. When this is done, when everything's back to normal, assess the fruit in your life. I guarantee you that over however many months, however many weeks of faithful Bible reading, of a healthy spiritual diet, you are going to grow and you're going to see God's fruit produced in your life. So this is a positive opportunity. Take all of this free time and get in God's word. Get on a good, healthy diet and you're going to benefit from it. But something else that we can benefit from slowing down is solitude and prayer. If when we read, we actually, we actually reflect and then we receive from God's word, prayer is an opportunity to get alone and then to give to God. Specifically to give God control and power over our lives. And this is a wonderful opportunity to slow down and to get alone and give to God his will, his control, his power over our lives. And solitude and prayer is such an important thing because Jesus actually modeled that in his life. In Luke chapter 5, we see Jesus in the midst of a crazy life. Everything's busy. He literally has thousands of people following him, wanting to be taught and healed and all these things. But in Luke chapter 5, it, it tells us that as the crowds are following Jesus, he broke away. He got alone in solitude and he prayed to God. Think about that. The second person of the Trinity saw solitude and prayer as so important he did it himself. We see that Jesus, as he's about to be, um, uh, you know, as he's about to go to the cross, he walks with his disciples, but then he breaks off from them. He gets in the garden. He gets alone and he prays to God. He gets alone and he prays, but then he shows us the importance of this prayer. As he's about to go to the cross, he says, you know, God, if you can take this cup away from me, if I don't have to go and die, please take it away. But nevertheless, not my will, not my human will, not my natural will to stay alive, but your will. See, when we pray and when we get alone, we actually reorient our lives away from ourselves, away from what I want, away from my will, away from self-dependence, and we turn ourselves to God, to his way, to his will, to what he wants to do. It's why when we pray the Lord's Prayer, it's our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's reorienting ourselves away from me and on to God. And that is done best when we're alone, when we've got away from all of the noise, all of the craziness, all of the distractions, and we say, Jesus, you're number one. Tell me what you want me to do, and I'll do it. It's kind of like a GPS. Like, I'm sure we've all been in the car, and we start going the wrong way. And then the little woman on the GPS, Siri, whoever, goes recalculating, recalculating, and then put us back on the right direction. That's what happens when we pray. We recalculate our lives and put ourselves back into the right direction in the will of God. We're saying, Lord, I give you control over my life. And I've actually recently done this and I'm telling you, I'm telling you Thrive, it is wonderful and it's worth it. As I'm sitting at home and I'm just being bombarded by all of this stuff, all of this noise, there's all of these videos and Instagram and YouTube and Netflix and Disney Plus and video games and I'm working on content for you and there's just too much stuff. I finally broke away. I put everything down. I didn't bring my AirPods with me. I went outside and I went for a walk. I got basically alone, right? No one was with me. I wasn't listening to a bunch of stuff and I walked probably two and a half miles because just being by myself was so fulfilling and so wonderful. But not only that, I spent that time to pray. I prayed in my heart because I didn't want to look like a crazy person walking around my neighborhood talking, but I prayed to God. And in that moment, I just broke away from the world and I asked God, what do you want me to do? How can I best be a Christian and a pastor and a 
everything that I am during this crazy time. And it was one of the most relaxing, helpful, wonderful things that I could do. And so here's, here's what I want to talk to you about, is that as we've entered into all of this craziness, as we're shut in our homes, as we're stuck here, we have basically been forced into a time of solitude. We can't go see our friends. We can't go to Starbucks. We can't, you know, be even be at church together. We've been forced into solitude. And so I want to encourage you, rather than running from it, lean into it. Enjoy this time of being alone. Take advantage of it. And so I, I want to encourage you, actually be alone. I want to encourage you, now that you're forced into your house, spend time with your family and then also spend time just by yourself. I want to encourage you that now that you've been forcibly taken away from all of the busyness and the noise of life, don't fill your life with extra noise. Like, don't fill all of your time at home with just more YouTube or more Netflix or more video games or more music or whatever than you normally would. Actually take that time to just get some silence in. Go for a walk. Be outside in God's good creation. Take some time to be in solitude. But not only that, as you get alone, take some time to pray. Take this time of self-reflection and prayer that all of the noise has been stripped away. Take some time to actually reorient and recalculate your life away from me and towards God. I guarantee that you can do it and it will be worth it. So here's my question. Maybe you need to pause the video after this and reflect again. What was your prayer life before Corona? Did you pray regular? Did you get alone? Did you talk to God? Or was just life a bunch of noise and craziness? But if prayer is giving control to God and saying, God, not my will, but yours, here's my real question. Before Corona, who was in charge of your life? Who had control of your life? Was it you or was it God? And look, I don't mean this in this like, you know, were you an outright crazy person, sinner, being the worst person you can. I, I just simply mean who is in control of your life and who is your main focus? Was life about God and about loving people and serving people and establishing God's kingdom here on earth and being a Christian? Or is it just all about the here and now, about sports, about really good grades, about whatever after school program you're in, about being in the band, about working on your next drama and theater and all of those whatever things and hanging out with friends and trying to be popular and my boyfriend or girlfriend. Like, was life all about you even if some of those things are good things? Or is it primarily about Jesus and those things fit into it? Because I'm willing to be bet for so many of us, life was all about me. I was in the driver's seat. I was the one in control of everything. And it's not that I was a bad person. I just wasn't a Jesus-centered person. Here is my encouragement for you. Take this time, pray to the Lord, and reorient your lives away from me, away from myself, and on to Jesus. Take some time to get alone and say, Lord, I'm sorry that life has been all about me, but our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Your kingdom come, your will be done in my life, in my heart, in my mind, in my relationships as it is in heaven. And I want to encourage you, actually combine scripture and prayer together. One of the most fulfilling things that I've found during this time is I've actually been praying the Psalms. Like, I don't know about you, but prayer is really hard sometimes. Like, I've got the attention span of a squirrel. So if I just go in there trying to, you know, think up everything that I want to say, unless something's really weighing on my heart, like, I'm going to get distracted and be out, like, in another world. But when I have a template, it helps me. I have been 
through reading the Psalms and letting spirit-inspired scripture guide my prayer life, and it's been beautiful. And you can set up like a whole prayer service. Like there are prayers of worship and thanksgiving. So you can start your prayer off by just saying, thank you, Lord, for what you've done through, th through certain Psalms. There are Psalms called the penitential Psalms. So you can ask Jesus to forgive you of your sins and set you right through those times. If things are weighing on you, if you've got a lot of problems, there are so many Psalms asking the Lord for help and putting your faith in Him. And so you can actually read those Psalms, put yourself in the story, and ask God to help you with whatever your situation is. I want to encourage you, pray the Psalms. It is one of the most satisfying, beautiful, God-glorifying helpful things to the soul. And so I want to encourage you, reorient your life, set a daily time of prayer, use the scriptures, get alone with God, be alone, and it will reorient your life towards him and you'll be better for it when life gets back to normal. But finally, and I just want to end with this very quickly, I want to encourage you to rest. Rest is a biblical principle. When God created everything, what did he do? He rested on the seventh day. When God brought his people out of Egypt in the Ten Commandments, he says, on, on the Sabbath day, you will do no work. You will rest and reflect on me. In the Christian tradition, we still have this principle of Sabbath. On Saturdays, no, we still work, we still do stuff and whatever, but we've kind of moved our day to the Lord's day, the eighth day, the day of new beginnings, the day that Jesus resurrected from the day from the dead. Sunday, that's when we gather for church. That's when we typically rest and stop and, and reflect on Jesus. And, and so there's this principle of rest. Jesus actually told his disciples in the gospel of Mark, I believe it was chapter six, I believe that they had actually come back from doing ministry. And, and Jesus basically told them, hey, you need to get away and you need to just rest. Like don't do anything for a while before I send you out again. Jesus was so tired from ministry in the middle of a storm, he took a nap like under the boat, right? Like I'm sure you remember that story. Like he modeled rest. And so rest and Sabbath and relaxing is a good thing and it's a God thing. And, and, and honestly, if we're real with ourselves, many of us before Corona had crazy busy lives. Like we didn't rest very much. And so we were always going doing homework, going to an after school program, going to practice for whatever sport you play, going to the actual game, working part time jobs, seeing our friends, seeing our boyfriend and our girlfriend, doing family stuff. I mean, it was almost like we couldn't even breathe. And I've, I've been there too. I remember one time when Pastor Derek was here, I was a college student and I was involved in literally everything. Like I worked a job, I dated Elizabeth, I was in college full time, I served in kids church, I served in Thrive, I served in worship upstairs on Sunday mornings, I did all of this after, you know, all of this extracurricular stuff for church, I couldn't even breathe. And I remember we were out to eat with Pastor Derek, actually hanging out in Greenville, and my dad randomly brought up to Derek, oh yeah, Evan's quitting everything. And it was so embarrassing because I hadn't planned to tell him yet, but it was one of the most freeing things because I finally, for the first time in a while, got to rest. And so now that we're being forced to kind of pump the brakes, I want to encourage you, lean in to rest because it's a good thing and it's a God thing. So here's what I'll encourage you. Right now, enjoy rest. You may never get another time of extended forced rest in your life. Take it in and enjoy it. Two, spend time with your family. You're being forced to be indoors with them. Enjoy your time with them. I know your siblings annoy you. I know you probably think your parents are stupid. Look, I get it. They're not stupid. You're going to have a great relationship with your sibling one day. It's all going to work out. Enjoy it right now because you may never have that again after this season of life. I want to encourage you to spend time reflecting on God. Do what you're doing now. Watch our sermons. Watch our sermons on Sunday mornings. Uh, watch devotionals. Listen to Christian music. Like Spend time reflecting on God. I want to encourage you, get outdoors. 
Take this time to get away from a screen. Be in God's beautiful and wonderful creation. He created it for you to rule over, to enjoy, to see his beauty and his glory. Be outside. It is worth it. But also, I want to encourage you, take a principle of rest that, that, that transforms your life after you go back to normal. So what can you do to value rest when life gets normal again? Well, here's what you can do. You can set a designated time of rest. Maybe you have a busy schedule, but maybe you can say, all right, every Sunday when I get home from church between 2 p.m. and 6 p.m., I'm not working, I'm not working on schoolwork, I'm not practicing an instrument, I'm not doing this or that, I'm just going to rest, I'm going to take a nap, play video games, do something or whatever, and then I'm going to work. I'm going to work on homework or whatever it is that I need to do, but I'm going to put in time to rest. Do that if you need to. Um, maybe you need to take time to see what you need to cut out to rest. Maybe you're just too busy. Like, think about all of the things you're involved in and think about the things that you could probably quit. Maybe you don't really care about that sport all that much. Cut it out. Maybe you don't really care about that after-school activity that much. Cut it out. Maybe you're spending every waking moment with your friends and even though you love them, it's just too much. Cut it out. Do what you got to do, all right? But finally, I want to encourage you. What are the things that you're doing that are keeping you from resting in God's community? And what do you need to cut out? Maybe you're enjoying that sport a lot, but you're never at church. You're never at Thrive. You're never in good community that refuels you. Maybe you need to think about stepping back. Man, maybe you're doing dramas and plays and all that stuff and it's wonderful, but you literally can't ever be at church, ever. Maybe you need to cut it out when you get back. Maybe it's just not worth it. Maybe you're working too much. Maybe you need to go to your boss and ask him to cut back your hours and say, hey, I'm sorry, I, I just can't work on Wednesday nights. I need to value community and rest with the people God's given me. I just want to encourage you, think about the ways that you can change your life for the better when all this is said and done. Well, look, here's my encouragement to you. Be encouraged. Let's use this opportunity to grow better, to grow deeper in our relationship with God. Let's come out better on the other side of this thing. I love you so much. I'm praying for you, Thrive. I'll see you at all the various online events that we have. Follow us on Instagram to stay updated. I love you, and I will see you then.